We focus a lot on Israel because Israel is the focus of end times Bible prophecy. Um, well, here's my friend Jack Hibbs talking about an interesting fact about Bible prophecy. This takes about three minutes. God's covenant is sure and certain. Genesis 28 verse 10 says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went down to Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night. Because the sun had set, he took one of the stones that he had placed under his head and laid down there to go to sleep. Then he dreamed a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth, and its top reached up into heaven. And there were angels of God ascending and descending on the ladder. Verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Genesis 28, 18. Then Jacob arose in the morning, listen, took the stone that he had put underneath his head, set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it, and Jacob called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of that city was previously called Luz. I want you to look at the little photo thing we're going to show you on the screens. This, don't go to the next slide. Church, listen to this. This was actually uh, something that I got from Israel. I, uh, it was a gut ordained moment because I was cruising around a store and um, I'm looking at this satellite map because I, I thought it was awesome. And um, the little lady at the store, little Jewish lady, she said, um, listen, why don't you look at Bethel? See Bethel? Why don't you turn the map sideways? And why don't you read it? And she showed me what this says. Now look at this. You, just to give you a, a reference, here's the Dead Sea, Jordan River. So now north is over here as it's indicated. When you rotate it to the left, you see that right there in the mountains of Israel? This has not been doctored up. This is a, a geosat photograph from a United States government satellite picture of Israel. You see that right here? Next slide. See this here? That's Bethel, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Next slide. See that? You say, well, what's your point? Well, we were in Israel again last month. I saw the same map. In fact, we were down at the Dead Sea, at the Masada National Park. And I was, I was there, and I asked the, the lady that was working behind the counter. This is a different lady. She's going through all the hubbub of making money and all that. And I said, excuse me, but what does it say on that map? And she's going like this, and she doesn't have time to talk to me, this dumb American, you know. And, and she turned, and she looked, and she said, I don't know. And I said, well, what if you turn it sideways? I was really plain dumb to put this forth. And she turned it, and she said, oh, my. It's Yahweh. It's Jehovah. She, I didn't tell her what it said. She's a Hebrew. She said it. And she said to her coworkers in English, I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps. God has written his name in the land. Jacob was there. He got up in the morning and he says, I'm going to call this Bethel, the house of God. God says in his word, I have written my name in the land. Now we're going to, uh, quick prophecy update. I'm going to try to fly through this. Remember, one of the patterns that Jesus said that at the end times, it would be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And we know that one of the things that was going on at the time of the days of Lot was that there was a lot of homosexual activity. I present to you, now remember this has been a very straight uh, progression. About 2008, California enacted Proposition 8, which recognized, said that man, woman, uh, marriage would be the only kind of marriage recognized in the state of California. That had to be put through as a constitutional amendment in front of the voters because prior to that, the California Supreme Court had said that gay marriage, marriage between people of the same sexes, would be, was permissible under California law, that it was a denial of equality. So the citizens of California, by a majority vote, 53 to 47%, said, we want marriage to be man-woman. Subsequent to that, there was a court case, Ted Olson and... Um, uh, the other guy that was on the other side of the, of the Bush-Gore uh, uh, controversy in 2000, David Boyes.
David Boyce and Ted Olson represented a man or a couple that said that they were being denied equal protection of the law. And so this homosexual judge, uh, Vaughn Walker in, Ca in California in 2010, said that that law was unconstitutional. Now it's been argued, uh, or it's gonna be argued, has it been argued? It was argued before the Supreme Court, the decision should come down sometime in June as to whether that law stands or falls. It's been a very interesting progression as to, and, and now I think if they took the constitutional amendment to the voters of California, it probably would lose, to be honest with you, the way things have changed. But one of the things that people like, in fact, the morning the, after the decision in California in 2010, I was having breakfast with Jack Hibbs, and we were very upset about that decision. That's uh, dominated a lot of our breakfast conversation that morning that how could this happen? The judge was a religious bigot. There's no doubt in my mind about it. He did not like Christianity at all. And he said, oh, everybody was moved by, they voted yes in favor of that definition of marriage, which has been the definition of marriage since, oh, you know, the Garden of Eden. That definition of marriage was bigoted. The man is a fool. The man is the living embodiment of Romans chapter one. <coughs> where God gives them over to a reprobate mind. He's homosexual. What's that? He is, a homosexual. he is a homosexual, that's correct. Well, the, there were talk about that, but he decided not to recuse himself. One of the things that Jack and I talked about was, and Jack in fact preached on it the following Sunday, what does this mean for Christians going forward in the future? This was three years ago. And one of the things we talked about was that it's gonna be very difficult on Christians it's gonna to lead to persecution of Christians. It's gonna to lead to hate, hate speech, codes, all sorts of things. And now I'm showing to you, the Department of Justice has issued new regulations. This is a copy of them, you can find them on the internet. LGBT inclusion at work, the seven habits of highly effective uh, managers. Put out by a group of lawyers at the Department of Justice, all of whom are homosexual. And one of the things that it says is it has these rules that you need to follow. Acknowledge and engage with LGBT employees. Come out if you're one of them. Speak up when appropriate. All of these things are things that people are supposed to do. But I've mentioned a couple times, there's a pastor. Uh, he's a tent maker pastor. He has a full-time job. Works at a large bank in this community. You probably, well, J.P. Morgan. And one of his concerns is that eventually he'll be asked to sign a document that says you not only have to support, not speak against gay marriage, you have to speak out in favor of it. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that's John. This is America. I mean, we have free speech, but they can't make you speak. In the regulations down here, it says, know how to respond if an employee comes out to you. Okay, you see that right down there? And here's what it says. Don't judge or remain silent. Silence will be interpreted as disapproval. We now have in our government regulations coming into effect that you will have to speak in favor of homosexual marriage. If you don't, you're fired. It's going to happen. And the church needs to tell all of its people that these things are coming and you need to know how to respond and stand firm on the Bible, on the word of God, when those, when those things come to you. Because they are, I am confident, coming to all of us. Now, this is a time lapse. No, it's not showing up, is it? This is the time lapse of the um, tornado in Moore, Oklahoma the other day. It's a fascinating, I mean, the devastation that this thing caused was just uh, enormous. I'm sure you've all seen uh, the pictures. An F5 tornado. After seeing what that, and the fact that only 24 people passed away or were killed in that thing is just uh, amazing to me. But it was on the ground for about 40 minutes. 
very slow moving, about 1.3 miles wide, a huge, huge storm. Um, this is some of the pictures of a neighborhood and more. Another picture of a neighborhood, you can see how it went through there, just devastation. Now there are some reports, I've been able to confirm them that there was a large gay pride uh, rally in Oklahoma City uh, just a couple days before this happened. Uh, you can read about that on John McTurnan's blog, John, McTurnan, John McTurnan's Insights. And it, it, just type in John McTurnan, M-C-T-E-R-N-A-N, apostrophe S, John McTurnan's Insights, and he'll raise that up. Chuck, did you have something to say? Correct. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, over July 4th. I think, I think that's right. Okay, now, England. Won't talk too much about this, but there's been the news. They've gone back and looked at their most recent census in England. And what they found is that Christians could be a minority in 10 years in England. Now, that's a minority compared to any other religious group. The majority of people are non-religious in England. Um... A new analysis shows that a decade of mass immigration helped mask the scale of decline in Christian affiliation among the British-born population while driving a dramatic increase in Islam, this is England now, particularly among the young. It is suggests that only a minority of people will describe themselves as Christians within the next decade for the first time. Meanwhile, almost one in 10 under 25s in Britain is now a Muslim, and that's probably understated. Fraser Watts, a Cambridge theologian, said it was entirely possible that people identifying themselves as Christian could become a minority within the next decade on the basis of the figures. It is still pretty striking and is a worrying trend and confirms what anyone can observe, that in many churches the majority of the congregation are over 60, he said. Keith Porteous Wood, the executive director of the National Secular Society, said the long-term reduction of Christianity, particularly among young people, was now unstoppable. In another 20 years, there are going to be more active Muslims than there are churchgoers, he said. The number has dropped below critical mass for which there is no longer any justification for the established church. This is the secular guy speaking. For example, or ceremonies like the monarch going through, for example, or ceremonies like the monarch going through a religious ceremony at coronation. England has become secular. Much of the European continent is secular. You may not have heard, but over the last week, there have been nightly, daily riots in and around Stockholm, Sweden. How many of you have not heard about that? Okay, so about half of you have not heard about that. They're burning vehicles. Like crazy. This is a picture from the other night in Stockholm. A very stronghold, a very uh, a growing stronghold of Islam in Europe. Now you don't think of that when you think of the Nordic blonde, blue, blonde hair, blue eyed Swedes, but Islam is taking a foothold and it's a very active mi minority, but it is dominating the culture in Sweden today. And so there are these riots going on. This is a picture of cars burning. This is in the area around downtown Stockholm. And you see the result, hundreds of cars being burned. Now, just not to worry, the Swedish government is on it. Here is a lady giving a parking ticket to one of the burned out vehicles because it didn't have a proper identification tag on it. A tag as to when it started parking there. And she was asked about it, and she said, whatever. <laughs> so this, is what the, this was from a Swedish newspaper today. We go to the crime scenes, but when we get there, we stand and wait, elaborated Lars Bistrom, the media relations officer of the Stockholm Police Department. If we see a burning car, we let it burn if there is no risk of fire to other cars or buildings nearby. By doing so, we minimize the risk of having rocks thrown at us. This is political correctness and tolerance run amok. But if you think that this is confined or going to be confined going forward to England or to Sweden, 
think again. It's coming here and it's probably present in a lot of our communities already. Now I speak about Islam because I do think that Islam is very significant and as we get into Revelation 17 we'll see this. And then this scene in England this week. On the streets of London, South London, a British soldier was attacked and they tried to hack his head off. They got about halfway done. The reports now are that the social, the security services knew of the murder suspects. They had examined them. They have looked at them, assessed them, but decided not to investigate them then deeply. There's concerns that there might be copycat crimes taking place in Europe. There was a French member of parliament who spoke out in Paris about this problem and said, you people in England need to know what's going to happen. And the next day, a soldier a French soldier was stabbed in the neck in Paris on the streets by a Muslim. Now, Melanie Phillips, I love Melanie Phillips. She's one of my two favorite authors, Caroline Glick, or columnist, uh, certainly in the top three. And she said, there's stiff competition for the most fatuous reaction award to this beheading, attempted beheading in London, which she has written a book called Londonistan, talking about what's happening in London with the growth of radical Islam, or Islam uh, is taking over many old churches in, in London. She cited a number of people who made just really idiotic statements about, well, you know, you really can't say that this was motivated by Islam, even though the guy standing there with bloody hands is quoting from the Quran and says that it is because of Islam that I'm doing this. The other was a guy named Boris uh, Johnson. Boris, yeah, I think Boris Johnson, who is the mayor of London. Here is uh, Cameron's comment. What happened yesterday in Woolwich has sickened us all. On our televisions last night and in our newspapers this morning, we have all seen images that are deeply shocking. The people who did this were trying to divide us. They should know something like this will only bring us together and make us stronger. Today, our thoughts are with the victim and with his family. They are grieving for their loved one, and we have lost a brave soldier. And this is what he, finished, he followed up with. This was not just an attack on Britain and on the British way of life. It was also a betrayal of Islam and of the Muslim communities who give so much to our country. There is nothing in Islam that justifies this truly dreadful act. That's candidate number one for the most fatuous statement about what happened. I think Melody Phillips picked a good candidate for that. And now here's a statement from Boris Johnson, the mayor of London. Plainly, this was a, a horrific incident. Uh, everything that I have seen and heard this morning leads me to conclude that uh, two things. Number one, that the, those guilty will be brought speedily to justice. And second, I have absolutely no doubt that Londoners uh, can go about their lives in the normal way today. This is not a question now of uh, blaming the religion of Islam. It is certainly not a question of blaming any aspect of British foreign policy or what uh, British art troops uh, are do in operations abroad when they risk our lives uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, everybody can see that this is the fault for this lies exclusively, wholly and entirely in the minds of those who were responsible for this crime and they are going to be brought to justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is what happens when Christianity disappears from a culture. You lose the ability to reason. This is Romans chapter 1 in action. God giving people over to a reprobate mind. But remember, the scripture is very clear that in the end times, there will be a fog of deception that will descend on the world. And you'll see it in, a, in two major areas. One is religious, and the other is in the area of geopolitics. Here, it's a combination of the two because religion, Christianity, has essentially died in England and the people have lost the ability to reason. God has given them over to a reprobate mind that when a man stands on the street in front of cameras with videos running and says, I did this because of Islam, these men can get up and say, it had nothing to do with Islam. 
a wonderful and peaceful religion. It's moronic. It does not make any sense. But you're going to see more and more and more of this going forward in this world if we are indeed close to the time of the Lord because God said the deception that's going to happen and the church religiously, geopolitically, will be, it will be apparent to the true believers. And I think we're seeing it everywhere. So who was the winner? Was it David Cameron or Boris Johnson? It was a tie, actually. And by the way, if you look at those pictures closely, I, I do want you to know that they were not in America making the movie Dumb and Dumber about 20 years ago. I know, I know it's hard to believe that they are not the same people, but I'm just saying, okay? I just want that to be clear, okay? Mark Stein said this, this passivity set the stone for what followed. In London, as in Boston, the political media class immediately lapsed into pneumatic, multicultural, multiculti Tourette's that seemed to be a chronic side effect of excess diversity celebrating. No Islam to see here, nothing to do with Islam. All these body parts in the street are a deplorable misinterpretation of Islam. The BBC's Nick Robinson accidentally described the men as being of Muslim appearance, but quickly walked it back. Less impressionable types get the idea that there's anything of Muslim appearance about a guy waving a machete and saying, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> a man on TV drip, uh, is on TV dripping blood in front of a dead British soldier and swearing by Almighty Allah, we will never stop fighting you. Yet it's the BBC reporter who's apologizing for causing offense. To David Cameron, drummer Rigby's, that's a soldier who was murdered, Horrific and was not just an attack on Britain and on the British way of life, it was also a betrayal of Islam. There is nothing on his, in Islam that justifies this truly dreadful act. And then this, a 22-year-old man, in fact, there are two additional people who have now been arrested and charged on suspicions of making malicious comments on Facebook following the murder of British soldier Lee Rigby. Benjamin Flatters from Lincoln was arrested last night after complaints were made to Lincolnshire police about comments made on Facebook, which were allegedly of a racist or anti-religious nature. What, relig what race, by the way, is Islam? Okay, let's move over to Israel real quick on our prophecy update. Muslim official said this, we'll give up the Temple Mount when Messiah comes. Jack Hibbs on his Facebook page said, okay. That's all he said. Uh, this report, this is a, a, a video, uh, you might remember it back about 2000, Muhammad al-Dura, who was a young child, was allegedly killed in a confrontation with uh, Israeli soldiers. It has been a subject of some controversy over time. Now, one of the things they've done, they've analyzed it, and they found out was that the Israeli soldiers really had no ability to do this. These are people, by the way, being filmed, making up, being attacked by British soldiers. You see how they, the guy fake falling down. Now they're carrying him to the ambulance. And here comes the ambulance. They'll put him in the ambulance and then watch this guy. Yeah, we've got another one. Yeah, all right. Now this is back to Mohammed al -Dur. This is supposedly when the child was shot and killed. And you see the child laying there. But watch what happens with the child in this video, you'll see this, the arm come up and it'll kind of look. Keep watching. There he is. So, um, panel this week said, oh, this is another lady. You see how the, you see this lady as she's crying and then you see all the videographers around. This is what happens all the time over there, folks. And yet, so-called Christian leaders go over there and they get duped by it. They're being duped. They're dupes. So the panel concluded that IDF did not kill Mohammed al dura in 2000. Okay, I'm going to skip here. Hang on. Okay. Quick update about Syria. 
Uh, Hezbollah is saying things about, uh, you know, they're going to fight to keep Assad in power. They're moving Hezbollah from Lebanon. Their soldiers are going over to Syria. That's a, a funeral in uh, Tripoli of a uh, Hezbollah fighter who was killed in Syria. Uh, there have been rockets fired uh, into uh, Lebanon from Syria by anti-Assad forces. The whole area is on the verge of melting down. You have the Al-Qaeda people fighting serious rebels, Syrian rebels who are independent. You have al-Assad fighting the Al-Qaeda rebels and the independent rebels. You have Hezbollah coming in. You have people coming in from Iraq to support different groups. And the whole area is very much on the verge of meltdown. Hezbollah, Nasrallah said this, if Syria falls, so will Palestine very serious situation. Israeli government is sort of wringing its hands because it doesn't know who to support or who to fight or what to do. Now, Isaiah 17 talks about Damascus ceasing to be a city at some point in the future. That's never happened. I don't know if one of the solutions that the Israeli government will say is well, let's at least get rid of Damascus and try to get control of the rest of the situation. Damascus may be on the verge of ceasing to be a city. It's the longest continuously existing city on planet Earth today, by all estimates. Been around longer than any. Caroline Glick said this, aside from the revealing of pathological uh, she's talking about the analysis, like who's fighting who, and we have good Al-Qaeda and uh, not really good Al-Qaeda, and, and we have these rebels over here. And she's saying, aside from revealing the pathological stupidity of Western news services, the attempt to make a distinction between good and bad Al-Qaeda forces fighting Assad points to the futility of trying to choose sides in this horrible war, which has already seen more than 80,000 killed, probably over 100,000. Moreover, everyone agrees that the conflict can spill out in two ways, ways which are not mutually exclusive. First, both the government forces and their Shiite allies, as well as their al-Qaeda opponents, could attack Israel. Both sides have a clear interest in attacking Israel, since the one thing they all agree on is that they wish to see Israel destroyed. The second danger is that weapons in Syria will proliferate far and wide. U.S. officials have already admitted that they have lost track of much of Syria's chemical weapons arsenal. Good news, Revelation 17. Let's get to the good stuff. Now look, I heard a good teaching this week. You need to go listen to it. Jacob Prash on Daniel chapter 10. Go to YouTube, or when I sent out the email about the, um, with telling you when the link is up to watch what we did here tonight, since we're covering it kind of quickly. Go to YouTube, do a search, Jacob Prash Daniel 10. That's all you have to type in. It'll come right up. It's a talk he gave in Iowa back in January. It's excellent. It will, um, what did you say, Mike? It will blow your mind or make your head explode or something. It's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> because it will make you think. You'll need to listen to it a few times. It's 78 minutes long. It's certainly not seeker sensitive or anything like that. It's <laughs> way too long. It's way too deep. It's excellent. I highly recommend it. And I will say up front, I don't agree with everything that Jacob said in there, but he's a lot smarter than I am, so maybe I just haven't risen up to the right level. But it's excellent, it's on a rant. And one of the points he makes out is that the prophecy in Daniel chapter 10, which related to Persia in part, was a horrific prophecy. And that prophecy has never, ever been fulfilled. Persia is modern-day Iran. Who is dominating the news in the Middle East outside of Israel? Iran. Iran changed in 1979. Before that, it was fairly pro-Israel in its orientation. It became the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979, and it has been violently anti-Israel ever since. The little Satan Israel, the big Satan the United States. It's all coming to a head. And imagine what happens if those people get nuclear weapons of some kind. What will happen to the world if one nuclear weapon goes off? Now, what happened in Daniel chapter 10 was Daniel was given a vision 
as to what would happen with Persia in the future. And I agree with Jacob, it's never been fulfilled. But look at what, Dan, what look at the prophecy was so horrific. Look at how Daniel reacted, godly Daniel, in the midst of prayer and fasting, worshiping, asking God to fulfill his prophecy. Here is how Daniel reacted to it. Now, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. While the men who were with me did not see the vision, nevertheless, the guys who didn't even see the vision, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. This must have been a horrible vision that he had. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. He went weak in the knees. That's Daniel looking at this, and Daniel is blown away, <laughs> to say the least. He goes white as a ghost, weak in the knees. He has no strength. He has to be helped up. So remember that as we go through. Now, I'm going to skip over a little bit of the first part of Revelation 17 because we've covered it, and you can catch uh, the rest of it online. But the first part of Revelation 17 is about the harlot of Babylon. Uh, John was carried away by the Spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous, blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns, a woman clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a cup, gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. Now, last week we talked about the concept of a harlot, the harlot mixing seed of many men in her, and how she's totally impure. And that what the Jewish law required, that a daughter of a priest who became a harlot was to be burned with fire. The same fate that's going to face the harlot in Revelation, which I think... The more I study it, I think, is the apostate church. Also, we talked about the fact that there is an admonition in Leviticus 19.19 19, that the Jews were not to plant two kinds of seed in the same field. And so the concept of mixing seeds is something that you see throughout the Old Testament. Don't mix things together. In fact, in Jesus talking about the first parable says that the sower sows the word. The word, the seed is the word of God. And so there's this concept that we should not mix seeds. We should not mix things with the word of God. And we've talked about Laodicea, which talks about mixing hot and cold and that being very distasteful to the Lord. And that what the apostate church will do is it will mix things together. Mix things with the word of God, like the Quran that we've talked about, that Steve mentioned a little bit ago. And these things are an abomination to the Lord, the mixing of impure things with the pure word of God. So the woman is drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of, witness, blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Seven heads, ten horns. Remember that as we read through these next few pa uh, verses. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. Okay, so when John's writing this, at the time he's writing this, there is a, a we'll call it a beast empire. We'll call them beast empires. There is a beast empire in effect, okay? But the one that's going to come at the end is a beast empire that was and is not so it's not in existence at the time that John is writing this beast empire. It was in the past. It'll be revived in the future. But when John's writing, that beast empire is not in existence. Now, what does that tell you? What empire was in existence when John wrote Revelation 17? Rome. John wrote about 96 AD is when most people, most good scholars think that uh, Revelation was written under the reign of Diocletian, who was a great persecutor of Christians. There are some preterists, people who believe that Bible prophecy has pretty much all been fulfilled. We're just waiting for the return of the Lord, and there's nothing else that needs to happen. That's one form of preterism. 
And they believe the, the only way they can get that, though, is if Revelation was written about 65 AD before the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So the beast was not and is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name was not found, has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. The beast which was it is not. So the beast that used to be, it's not now, so it's not Rome, is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven. I'll explain that in a minute. I've got some maps, and this is going to carry over into next week, obviously. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast, the final beast empire, for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. And my slides got out of order. So I skipped 9 and 10, so let me go back to 9 and 10. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen. Five beast empires have fallen. One is, that would be what? John writing in 96 AD, that would be Rome. The other has not yet come, and when he comes, he was remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. So there are seven. Five are fallen. One is. One's still coming. And there's going to be a relationship between the seventh and the eighth. They're going to be similar. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not... Oh, I already read that. I'm sorry. I thought it sounded familiar. <laughs> these, the ten kings, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because the Lord, he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the, get that concept as you read through prophetic passages that the waters, the sea, is, represented, is a representation of the nations. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot, the one who mixes the seed, will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will what? Burn her up with fire. The same punishment that was to be given to a daughter of a priest in Israel who became a harlot. She was, if she was found guilty of that, she was to be burned with fire. Verse 17, for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast, their, can I, can I say it? They're purpose driven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only quoting the scripture, folks. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now look, there's a lot of different views as to who Babylon, who this harlot, and who the, the final beast empire is. Some people will say that Babylon must be New York City. It's the financial capital of the world. I don't think that that's true. But there are good people that come to that conclusion. Okay, I think you just need to look at it. There are some that say, well, Rome, Rome must be the final beast empire. But I think we just saw that John says that that final empire is one that is not at the time that he's writing it. So I think that Rome is excluded. Now, Rome gets a pass because Rome was built on seven, the city of seven hills. But there are a number of other cities that are cities of seven hills. Um, I, I know there are some in the United States. Cincinnati. Oh, Cincinnati. That is Babylon. <laughs> Now, don't take that out of context, and don't cut that out of the recording and pass that around, okay? Cincinnati is not Babylon, okay? Uh, Mecca has seven hills. Did you know that? 
But the seven hills are identified in that passage, and I'm not going to scroll back to read it. The seven hills are seven kingdoms, not a city with seven hills, but seven kingdoms that are part of this. So um, I've got about three minutes. My wife's saying two. I'm taking three. The Middle East. I want to just briefly go th- uh, give you a concept. The seven kingdoms, really eight, the eighth is part of the seven, comes out of the seventh, are kingdoms that have dominated the Jewish people throughout history. And they're all focused on the Middle East. So if we look at this, now the first kingdom, which is not included in the list that to be counted, is Babylon. But the, or Babel, the, the kingdom of Babel was the first kingdom. Its influence, the Babylonian influence, has been profound throughout history. You can go to Rome, and if you know anything about the Babylonian system and the false teachings and the sun wheel and the fertility goddess Isis and the sun Tammuz and all this stuff, all of this is is all through Rome. And today, it's all through the Roman Catholic Church. What they did was they took the pagan things from Babylon, they Christianized them or said they were Christianizing them, and they became part of the Catholic Church. So the pagan temples became um, the pagan temples became Catholic churches. Not I will not use the term Christian, <laughs> so-called Christian churches. The time of Abram. Abram lived about 2100 BC. He went from Ur, that city there. He went all the way. Well, you over. need to read all those Actually passages because they relate heavily to Revelation the chapter you 17. Can go. You can't walk through. And we but will you can cover see that today. next week. That Abraham may have walked through back in those days. It's the oldest gate found in antiquity. But the first kingdom that dominated the Jewish people, and I'll be very quick with this, was Egypt. And you can see how the Egyptian empire went up the Nile and up through the land of, then the land of Canaan. Now this is what the kingdoms of the world looked like at about 1400, 1440 BC, at the time of the Exodus. So Egypt was the first of the seven, we'll call them seven, eight kingdoms. A little closer view of it. The second kingdom was Assyria. And that kingdom uh, was in the Fertile Crescent, the area of Babylon, headquartered in Nineveh. You can read about it in Jonah and some of the other prophets. And this is a representation of what the world looked like, the kingdoms of the Middle East looked like at about 720 BC when Nineveh came in and took over the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Because you can see, if you can see closely, where Jerusalem is and to the south is a little blue thing, and that says Judah. So that kingdom was not taken over by Nineveh. The kingdom of Judah continued to exist for another 135 years or so. So Assyria was... That kingdom. There you can see Judah a little bit better, just south of Jerusalem. Thank you. (laughs) And I will stop with this slide, since we have 12 minutes to get out of the room. It's also important when you look at Revelation 17 that you understand Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9. Now this is a timeline based on Daniel chapter 9, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Daniel describes five kingdoms so we have two okay we have egypt and assyria and those were in mind when john wrote about the seven so daniel only talks about five but two and five is seven so there's a correlation between the kingdoms of daniel and the kingdoms the empires that john also wrote about and john writes about the kingdoms in daniel chapter two he describes a great statue. We'll talk about that next week. Head of gold, arms and chest of silver, thighs of bronze, legs of iron, 
and then feet of iron mixed with clay with ten toes. The ten toes is emphasized. Daniel chapter 7 talks about these empires by using the description of a animal. The winged lion for Babylon, the bear raised up on one side for the Medo-Persian Empire, the four-headed winged leopard, which represents Alexander and the Macedonian Empire, and then a great beast empire uh, that comes at the end and destroys all the others, and then also has a final manifestation. That would be, so if we're taking it from Revelation, which has eight kingdoms, it would be, that would be kingdom three, four, five, six, seven. Wait a minute. Well, yes. <laughs> now, Daniel chapter eight, though, changes the animal for Medo-Persia to a ram with two horns and the Macedonian Empire to a goat with a single horn. So next week we'll start, we'll go through Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9. Real quickly, we'll show how it relates specifically to the kingdoms and the empires. I have a beautiful chart that I think will help you understand how everything is done. And then we will be able to identify the identity of the final beast empire. Most prophecy teachers teach you that this is Rome. I do not agree with that. Now, were those people wrong? Are they heretics? Are they, no. They're all good people. They're trying to figure out what the scripture says. And when you look at the way the scripture has been in the light of the way that the world was for a long time, Rome made a lot of sense. But there's another problem that's come up in the world. And I think that that is where the beast empire will be manifested. So it's all very much tied together. You need to read these passages, Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, and 12.